Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Before we begin our study, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence into our midst as we open your word, as we continue to examine our hearts in the light of the truths that have unfolded to us. We know, Lord, that your purposes for us are to reflect Christ's character. And we know, Lord, that we do so very imperfectly. And we just ask that um, your grace can be manifest in our lives, that those we come in contact with will come in contact with you. And we pray, Lord, for one another. You know the struggles that we face with self. And we just ask, Lord, that we can submit to your teaching, to your, to your yoke, and that we can learn of the meekness and lowliness of Christ. Be with us now. Through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Now, um, yesterday we were finishing off. Dwight was going through some of this uh, highlighted material that he had. Uh, do you remember specifically, Dwight, what some of the things that you were noticing? And, and it's Ellen White's comments on 1 Samuel 2, verse 30. One, one thing we had noticed was this... Uh, about uh, Ezekiel 28, verse 3, where it says, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that they can hide from thee, which is reference to the king uh, or the prince of Tyrus, which um, normally when we, we look at this, it, there's going to be this prince of Tyrus, and then there's this lament, lament over the king of Tyre, which is... Um, uh, typical of Satan, right? So we're all familiar with Ezekiel 28. But there is uh, a context in which that occurs and why, why Tyre has that symbolism. I don't know. Do we need to comment on that a bit more about Tyre? Because we just kind of touched on that near the end of the study. But we didn't, we didn't dwell on it. Any thoughts? No thoughts on that? Does anybody want me to go over the issues with Tyre, what Tyre symbolizes? I need some direction, people. <laughs> sure. Sure, go. Yeah, okay. sure. Sure, you can go ahead, Theodore. I know. I, I don't retain that well. I don't know about the rest of us. <laughs> okay. So now this goes back to 2016. So uh, Michael and I, when we were at the School of the Prophets World, when Heidi and I were there, Stephen was there as well. Um, but Michael was one of the staff. And and we had this discussion, this study, where we came to understand some things about Tyre. And we ended up presenting it in Alabama. We were going to go over there from Arkansas and did uh, a weekend presentation, which primarily, I guess, was um, dealing with, with Tyre and the symbolism there. Also did some presentations regarding the chronology of uh, the kings of Judah uh, in the Babylonian period. But so we all should be fam familiar with Ezekiel. Here I'm going to go. Here I'll show the screen. In Ezekiel 28, you're going to have this uh, prophecy against the prince of Tyre. Now the context in which this occurs is Ezekiel in chapter 20. On the 10th day of the fifth month, he's going to have his third vision. And what's the significance of the 10th day of the fifth month, this third vision? Angela, you have a comment? Can you answer that? No, I'm just trying to get my head together and scramble yeah. here for my notes. Yeah, the, the yeah, fall, fall of Jerusalem, right? Or the destruction of the temple? The destruction of the temple in 586 B.C., and in 70 AD. So the temple was destroyed on the same biblical date, uh, the first temple and the second temple. Now it's also uh, going to be one year to the day from when he had finished lying on his left side for 390 days. So that symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month was actually the primary symbol that led to the July 18, 2020 prediction because we dealt with the 10th day of the fifth month from Ezekiel. We saw that this was a repeated date dealing with the destruction of the temple. And, um, and uh, it ended up uh, being confirmed 
like a hundred other ways, but also through Revelation 9. And so, so Ezekiel is predicting the destruction of the temple on the 10th day of the fifth month that's going to happen after this siege that he's predicting. So he's predicting the siege, but he's also predicting the date that the temple is going to be destroyed. Now, when the siege uh, ends, when the walls of Jerusalem are broken down, uh, Tyre is going to mock, right? They're going to mock the Jews for their temple, or for not for the temple, but for the walls being broken down. And they're going to do that on the first day of the fifth month in 586. But anyway, here, what's going to happen in Ezekiel 20 is he's going to prophesy regarding the destruction of Jerusalem. And he's going to do that all the way from chapter 20 to through to 23. When he gets to chapter 24, it's going to be when the siege begins, right? So he's going to be prophesying. And then the day that the siege begins in the ninth year, of Zedekiah in the 10th month, on the 10th day of the month, we have the siege, which is actually technically going to be in January of 587. And even though he's 500 miles away, God's going to uh, give him a vision at the very day that the temple is, or not the temple, the city is under siege. This is the day that the siege begins, right? So in Ezekiel, he never mentions specifically the day that the city is destroyed or the day that the temple is destroyed. He's not going to mention those, but he's going to foreshadow those. Those are going to be mentioned in other places in scripture, the dates. Uh, but this date is also, I believe in Jeremiah as well, the, the 10th day of the 10th month in the ninth year of Zedekiah, that we're going to have the, the siege begin, right? And it's going to last for a year and a half siege. Now, when the siege begins, there's a bunch of things that happen. Uh, one is uh, Ezekiel's wife is going to die, and that's going to be a symbol for when the temple is going to be destroyed, right? And he's not supposed to mourn the loss of his wife. He's told that she's going to die, and when he dies, he's not going to mourn, and he's going to tell the people that when the temple is destroyed, you're not going to mourn. You're not supposed to mourn. OK, so that hopefully everybody kind of remembers those details. And then it says that he's he's going to um, basically be dumb until somebody who comes from the destruction of the city, who witnesses it with their own eyes, tells him of it. And then on that day, he's going to be no more dumb. So it talks about in the day that thy mouth be opened to him which is escaped and thou shalt speak and be no more dumb and thou shalt be a sign unto them and they shall know that I am the Lord, right? So the next uh, following chapters, uh, 25 is going to cover prophecies against Ammon, uh, Moab, Edom, and Philistia. And then you're going to have these prophecies against Tyre, right? So it's going to happen in, in chapter 26. <coughs> uh, it came to pass in the 11th year in the first day of the month. So it's going to be in the 11th year of Zedekiah on the, the ninth day of the fourth month that Jerusalem's walls are going to be be breached, right? And so when it says on the first day of the month, it doesn't tell you which month, but we know it's the next month. It's the first day of the fifth month. That um, otherwise, if it wasn't the first day of the fifth month, they would have to tell us what month it is. So the fact that they just give us the first day of the month means it's going to be the first day of the month that begins after the walls of Jerusalem are broken, right? Because Tyre is going to mock. It says, son of man, because that Tyrus has said against Jerusalem, aha, she is broken. That was the gates of the people. She has turned unto me. I shall be replenished. Now she is laid waste. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee as the sea causeth his waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. And I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. Now, um, there's more. But the basic idea that we have here is that uh, Tyrus is um, going to have a, some curses against it. 
And then it says in verse 7, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, which is just Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. So Babylon's going to end up having this war against Tyre. Now, there is a prophecy in Isaiah that we need to take. And it's Isaiah 23, verse 15. Now, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years, according to the days of one king. After the end of 70 years shall Tyre sing as an harlot. So this period of 70 years is referring to what period of 70 years? Hi, Stephen. Can you tell us about this period of 70 years and what you know about it? Since I know you know quite a bit about it. So the 70 years, these are applying to the time when Babylon shall have dominion. Okay. So it's not the time. Yeah. yeah. 609 to 539. Right. So it's, it's, it's the same 70 years where they're going to have 70 years that Babylon has. They're going to, Babylon's going to be given a period of 70 years in which to rule the Levant. Right. And, and people confuse it with the 70 years Babylonian captivity. Now, now what about this situation with Tyre? Because Tyre is, right, it's, it's going to be forgotten 70 years. And so that's specifically referring to why, why is Tyre forgotten for 70 years? So, so we use it as a symbol of something. Well, the papacy is in okay. a sense forgotten from 1798 until the Sunday law. Okay, right. So, so the days of one king, obviously, this is referring to the period of the Neo-Babylonian Empire from the time uh, that Assyria falls in October of, of 609 BC. And then Babylon's going to fall in October of 539. So that's going to be 70 years. And so we use this as a symbol then that Tyre symbolizes the papacy. So in 1798, uh, the papacy is going to fall, right? And the nation that replaces it, that is, is the United States, right? That is the United States rises in 1798. It's going to be uh, the days of one king, right? So now, now it's obviously not literally 70 years from 1798 to the Sunday law. It's just a symbol. Right. That is, we have the Tyre being forgotten. Now, Tyre was an economic power in the Levant um, through trade until Babylon came along. And that, that ended its sort of supremacy. Now, we know, of course, Assyria and Egypt had uh, taken turns in sort of controlling certain aspects of of uh, in their protection racket, but really it was Tyre that was profiting uh, from all of this economic trade. But when Babylon came in, uh, that put an end to Tyre's dominance economically. So, so that's how we apply that. So Tyre here symbolizes uh, in in Isaiah. It's going to symbolize the papacy. Okay. Now, what about in Ezekiel? When we go to Ezekiel 28 and well, 26, 27 and 28. But here it's going to talk about the prince of Tyre. So that word prince is going to be Sar. Oh, no, no, it's Nagid. This one, this is Nagid. And then you're going to have Melech when it talks about the king of Sire of Tyre. So why do we have uh, the prince of Tyre and then the king of Tyrus or Right, so it's Tyrus in both cases, but we have the prince, Nagid, that's like a commander, and then we have the king, Melech. Why do we have these two different characters? Okay, so around there, put 70 times 360 equals 25,200. Why do you bring that up? What's the context? Regarding you that. just mentioned the 70 years. Yeah, so 70 years, yeah. Okay, so there's nothing particular here that 
would, other than 70 years. Okay. No 360, just, just as a symbol. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so uh, just to your question. So yeah. one's applying to the literal King of Tyre and the other one's applying to the power behind the King of Tyre, which would be Satan. Okay. So which one's which? Well, I would understand it's going to be the Prince of Tyre. Tyre is going to be Satan. Okay. But here we're going to have, it's the King of Tyre, where we're going to have, thou hast been in Eden, in the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, etc. Right? Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So if that's the case, why why is there, with the king of Tyre here, why do we have uh, this description of, of Satan uh, prior to his fall, being the covering cherub? Now, and we can think, you know, this is sort of, in a sense, it's an aside, to what we're studying in, in in Chronicles, but there there is a connection, which is why we're looking at it, because this does relate to our message. But you have a reason why um, Tyrus here is um, that we have the Prince of Tyrus says, "Son of man, say unto the Prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because um, thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I." I am a God, and I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. And then it says, Behold, thou art wiser than Dan, and there is no secret that can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold, silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. Uh, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, a terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall devile, defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the sea. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man, and no God, in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die in the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And then it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord. So here we can see this, the word king, Melek, in Hebrew, rather than the Gid. And then that description Right, that was perfect in all the in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Right, and then it's going to talk about the multitude of thy merchandise that they filled the midst of thee with violence. That thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, and they, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Right? And then there's going to be a prophecy against Sidon after that. So that's the end of the prophecy against Tyre, which goes for about two and a half chapters in Ezekiel. Okay, so, I mean, it seems to be talking to the same person, but it's going to use the, the word prince, which is is more like a commander, right, of, of a military army, and then the word king. And in both cases, they have the same characteristics, that is pride and wanting to sit in the place of God. So, so here, um, when we have this uh, mocking that occurs, right? So there's this mocking that's going to occur on the first day of the fifth month, son of man, because that Tyreth has said against Jerusalem, aha, she is broken. That was the gates of the people. She has turned unto me. I shall be replenished. And now she is laid waste. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I'm against thee, O Tyrus, right? <clears throat> because of that mocking. So 
who is Tyre here or Tyrus in Ezekiel 26, 27, and 28? Is it is it really just Satan, not the papacy, or is it the papacy again? Any thoughts, anyone, on what, what Tyre is here? So we didn't really answer some, all of our questions yet, but there are things to think about. I, I was wondering if this could be talking about the fall of church and state, the fall of the U.S. plus the fall of the mainline SDA. Okay, explain how that would be. No, the, dealing- the, uh, the ruler being being the civil power and then the king uh, being the spiritual power, or maybe it's the other way around, but that did come to me. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not particularly certain. You know, definitely Tyre is at some point resurrected, and and here at this time, now we know that that Tyrus, when they do their mocking, when Tyre does its mocking, it, it's mocking at a time when Babylon is is predominant, right? So Babylon is going to come against Tyre when? So when does Tyre get destroyed initially? So there's going to be Babylon rises. It's going to predominate the Levant, you know, the, the Palestine area, all that area, Israel and Palestine and Syria from 609. Now, when does Tyre get destroyed? When is the prophecy against Tyre? Well, I think does... that's 573 around that time. Because it yeah. takes 13, 13 year siege. Yeah. Okay. Is it, uh, is it right that the prophecy, how it was literally, so literally fulfilled about, I will also scrape her dust from her? That, yeah, that's uh, which will be done by Babylon. That's going to be done later, not by Babylon. Yeah. Yeah. So that, some critics of the that, Bible say the this prophecy was not fulfilled. Right? Will you let me finish? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the scraping of the dust was what they scraped the dust from. Was it Tyre, or they scraped the dust and built a rock bridge over the water and put the dust in there, too, to make a road to invade? Is that how it worked? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. see, the quite, critics a, of, quite a literal fulfillment. Yeah. Now, the critics of the Bible always have a problem. One is Ezekiel, you know, is one of those uh, books that really it's hard to say that it was written later. Like, you know, they always try to say, well, when you have a prophecy, you know, it was obviously uh, that means the book was written after the prophecy was fulfilled. But they're going to be really hard pressed to get Ezekiel written later. Uh, One is because it has so much contemporary detail that would not have been known later. That is, if you're going to write the book of Ezekiel and give it all these really specific dates and all this information, and you're going to have it written, let's say, in the second century B.C., um, which they try to do, right? Since they have these events that have happened afterwards, um, you would have all kinds of anachronisms, right? Which which you don't see. Plus, it's it's going to be written in Hebrew that's from that period, not in Greek, um, and not in a later Hebrew, right? So it'd be impossible for people to do in those days. Uh, so it has a prophecy that's really specifically fulfilled regarding Tyre. Um, and that was definitely not fulfilled in that way in the time of Ezekiel or even shortly afterwards. So in the Babylonian period, the Tyre isn't destroyed in that way. It, it's going to be initially destroyed yeah. because because Nebuchadnezzar is going to labor over Tyre. How's that go? Um, and he's going to be given Egypt as the reward for all of his Something labor like that. That, that he didn't get paid for. Right, because because all of the riches once once they got into Tyre, all the riches were gone. They'd all been smuggled out, and so they're going to be given Egypt as a reward, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, that sounds familiar. That that yeah. idea that the that objection by uh, Bible doubters 
about prophecy being written after the fact. Yeah, that little booklet, I've mentioned it before, it's uh, called David Dare. David, D-A-R-E, David Dare. And yeah. uh, it's just a little booklet, but man, it's packed full of uh, evidence of prophecy being fulfilled. Yeah. And written before it was fulfilled. Yeah. And the other thing we have in Ezekiel, of course, is he's predicting the destruction of Jerusalem, not just in 586, um, but also in 70 AD, tying together Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, the fact that the temple is destroyed on the same date, that 10th day of the fifth month that shows up prominently in Ezekiel, is definitely impossible for people to have, uh, you know, work events so that Jerusalem or the temple would be destroyed on that specific date in 70 AD, 666 years after Jehoiachin's captivity or Ezekiel's captivity as well. So so there's a whole this bunch where, of... What's that? This is, this is where uh, chronology is really proving to be so important. You know, it's it really uh, supports Bible prophecy, a correct understanding of it. Yeah, and it's an objective measure, right? So as I've said many right. times, you know, people believe all kinds of things. I mean, we people believe all kinds of things and fool themselves into believing them. And so for me, I don't really trust my own feelings and my own subjective experience, to be honest. I mean, I just don't. Because um, I know other people who have subjective experiences that they believe that really uh, contradict reality. So... To me, personally, I need something objective outside of myself that tells me that something is true. So in examining Adventism, that was the thing that I I really knew, that here is something that I need to understand, uh, biblical chronology. So I began studying that, you know, like, what, 40, 42 years ago. You know, always, always keeping an eye out for things like that. And, And I have a natural aptitude for, like, numbers and calendars and dates and chronology anyway but it it took a lot of time like like the 666 years that ezekiel that comes from ezekiel that's that's not literally stated but uh symbolically implied and of course real like nobody can argue against it between the time that uh jehoiachin's taken captive because we have the date we know it's the the exact date it's in the Babylonian chronicles and uh and then you know we have the date for the destruction of Jerusalem which really can't be disputed you know um Josephus was there and records the date um that the temple is destroyed and and notes that it's the same date in which it was destroyed the first time the first temple was destroyed and that it's 666 years you know that is the count that Ezekiel gives, you know, in the fifth year of the captivity and the 25th year of the captivity, right? So it gives the year of the captivity and we see it's the 666th year of the captivity. It's just, it's just a fact. And, but it could not have been understood in the way that it is now in the past because they didn't have the tools to uncover that. So it's only at the end of the world but Ezekiel's prophecy can be even seen, right? You know, there's there's been so much coming to light in the last mm-hmm. ten years, twenty years, even. Yeah, because in the second century BC, nobody would have known the date that uh, or the year that the temple was destroyed the first time. They definitely wouldn't have known uh, when the temple was going to be destroyed. You know, three hundred years later. And then, you know, until the present, until we found the Babylonian Chronicles, you know, people had a date for the destruction of Jerusalem is 588. And that was Usher's date, you know, not 586. And then he had, of course, uh, Ezekiel's captivity earlier, right? So he's going to have his captivity in like, instead of 597, he's going to have it in 599, right? So he's he's going to be off because they didn't have a dated a document that they could date accurately for Jehoiachin's captivity and for the for the chronology of Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar How is Usher 
How is how is Usher uh, establishing his dates then? Well, other historical uh, records. That's or? Yeah, he's basically counting uh, the years that kings reigned, and and he's using some. He is using uh, Ptolemy's canon, but he doesn't have all of the information that he needs to. It's like measuring something with a yardstick uh, that's in, in uh, you know, fractions of an inch, uh, but your yardstick doesn't have any markings on it. So you're not going to be very accurate. Right? That's kind of what he had. He didn't have the, the precise dates. He just had spans of time, that is the reigns of kings. And so when he would lay them out, he doesn't know exactly where they fit. Does that make sense? Is that a good illustration or not? Yeah, no, that makes <clears throat> that makes really good sense. It's like uh, having a yardstick and measuring inches, but you're trying to measure quarter inches, or and yeah, there's no and, quarter inch markings. Yeah, yeah, the no, finer... no, and no inch markings even. It's just you just have a stick that's one yard. <laughs> oh. That's, right. that's pretty no rough. markings at all. That's pretty rough. Right? So you kind of have to. You know, yeah. Yeah. So you you have to sort of estimate, and that's that's sort of what he did. Um, now some things he got pretty close, but other things he didn't. Now Rand notes that uh, ten days and five months. Right. That's what you have there. It just it disappeared. I actually, I meant the that date of the tenth day of the fifth month. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the 10th day of the fifth month, 105 days is 25, 20 hours. Okay. Yeah, so so we can see that symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month. It's extremely important. And it was uh, also the destruction of the temple in, in, um, in Daniel chapter 9, uh, verse 26 and 27, where it talks about the midst of the week, Christ just crucified in the midst of the week, and of course, talks about the destruction of the city and the sanctuary that became really important in understanding the week of Christ, uh, that we could take the literal days and we could mark these as symbols. So, so the 10th day of the fifth month had all kinds of uh, importance in understanding the chronology relating to our time. So the symbol shows up again and again. It's now the, the Jews. Moment. Yeah, Stephen. It's also the midpoint between the first day of the first month and the 20th day of the ninth month? Yeah, so... Chapter yeah, 2? So, yeah, so in... Um, yeah, so in uh, Ezra, we have this chronology of, you know, Ezra leaving Babylon and going to Jerusalem, and then he gets to Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, and then he's going to be there for a while, and then on the 20th day of the ninth month, they're going to have that repentance, Right. And you're saying between the twentieth day of the ninth month and the tenth day of the uh, and the first day of the first month, the tenth day of the fifth month is the center date, right? So it it becomes part of this chiasm, and it's something that you know I need to actually work, work into that structure with the way I've drawn, drawn it. I've never uh, put that in there. I've never written it out, but it, it's important as a symbol that it is midway because we have all of those uh, mirrors in in 457 BC, you know, with Pentecost as the center, and then the 10th day of the seventh month as the center, and then obviously the 10th day of the fifth month as the center, depending on the various dates that he gives us. So he gives us the first day of the first month, the 12th day of the first month, uh, the first day of the fifth month, and uh, the 20th day of the ninth month, right? So, so we have three different chiasms, I guess, that, that are marked. That is, we have middle dates between these various dates, and one of them is the 10th day of the fifth month. So when we, I mean, we sort of gone a little far afield in the sense from where we were studying. Um, so we'll try to bring this back and see why we looked at that in detail. Um, so let me go back here. Now, this is going to be... Um, do you remember where this is, Dwight? I thought it was or which, which, which one about you... where, she, where she quotes Ezekiel twenty-eight, uh, verse three. Um, just a moment. 
It's going to be like page 26 or 27 or something like that. I think it's going to be about that in the copy you have. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, the question is, why does Ellen White apply this statement, which is talking about the king of Tyrus, to Ezekiel? It says, behold, thou, Ezekiel, art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. So the question is, why does she do that? I mean, it's pretty obvious that that it's not talking about Ezekiel, this verse. Now, the Lord God favored Ezekiel, the old and experienced servant of the Most High. He was older than Daniel. Daniel was growing in favor with kings, etc. So any explanation for that, how she can do that? She can just put Ezekiel in there. Or is, is she doing that? Or is, So this statement, manuscript 35, 1890, so you just copied that. So that Ezekiel is already there? That is correct. Okay. When when we read that portion of scripture, yeah. let's recall that it that that chapter begins. The word of the Lord came again unto me, unto Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, or Ezekiel, say to the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, and in the midst of the seas, that yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Then she continues, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. So is she giving a literal comment? Behold, Ezekiel, you are wiser than Daniel. You are wiser and you can give this explanation, this prophecy about the Prince of Tyrus. Well, if she's doing that, she's doing it in an interpretation that I would not ever put there. And everyone just says, you know, that this is what uh, Ezekiel is supposed to say to the Prince of Tyre. Right. Right. So. But I mean, this is this is one of. This is one time of two that she does exactly this. And this was this was the the more prevalent of the two. Where she puts Ezekiel here in this verse. That is that is correct. All right. So because it you know, it would follow naturally with thy wisdom and thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches. Now, I understand. Right, in verse four. And when you consider and, and continue verses four, five would give you that interpretation about the Prince of Tyrus again. And then verse six, therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart against, or thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall yeah. bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. And then by verse 11, we go on to a lament for the king of Tyre. So I just, I found this entire placement to be intriguing as to why and how this was was being done. Mm-hmm. Because when she's tying this in this same manuscript in with 1 Samuel 2 verse 30, it it made sense that she is saying that Ezekiel was being honored because Ezekiel as a priest had honored God, even though he was a priest at the time of the destruction of the temple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and the commentators all say this is just said ironically, right? That is behold thou art wiser than Daniel is just in, in sort of in his own, mind his own uh view right so i mean i'm i'm going to take the position that when she's applying it to ezekiel here she's just using the scripture in a way that the scripture doesn't actually literally say now is that allowed well i believe you said yesterday that as you see it this could be allowed yes and why do we have examples of that in scripture that 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 scriptures are 
misused by Bible writers, misused in quotation marks, for a purpose. I remember uh, Permender bringing up some examples of that uh, concerning the writings of Paul. Yeah, and uh, yes. So we have in, in Hebrews chapter 1 is a good example of, of, of Paul using a bunch of verses that definitely in context are not referring to Christ and say that they refer to Christ. Now, why, why can he do that? Like, for some people, you need to just take the verse as it says, right? That you, you can't use that verse in any other way. And, and a good example is actually the virgin birth. So we know that New Testament writers take Isaiah, where it talks about a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, Right? And they say, well, this is a prophecy on Christ, because in the New Testament they refer to Christ, but it's actually referring to the birth of Manasseh. And the virgin here is, is doesn't, doesn't refer to a virgin birth. It's just that a person that's a virgin is going to conceive, and, and that, that virgin is, is Hephziba, right? And it becomes she becomes symbolic of the virgin, virgin daughter of Zion, which we see later in Ezekiel. Is it chapter 62, uh, where you're going to see this, this connection, right? So the Bible writers use verses sometimes in ways that the verse is not intended to be used, but it illustrates something that is true. And so what do we do with that idea? Does this seem like we can just, you know, mold the scriptures however we want? Or is there some, some principle involved in doing this? Well, I know throughout my life, I mean, it's been, been, been about 50 plus years now. Even when I was very new to the scriptures, God would, God would give me, give me verses that applied to people I was encountering, situations I was going through. And I mean, I, I would compare verses with, with verses even then. So God does use his, I mean, his word is for all time and for all people. And he will apply it as he will. And he will, you know, give give you certain verses for certain people and situations. Like I said, Lord, watch can how can I minister to this person? Or show me what you're trying to teach me from this situation. And all these verses would, would would come to me, and they still do. And it's really, really helpful. So he'll apply his word as he will. And sometimes I say, Well, Lord, please confirm it. And he will do that, too. Maybe not okay. when I'm expecting him to, but he will eventually. OK, so now when I look at this, here's here's what I do is I see that Ellen White uses puts Ezekiel in here where we wouldn't put Ezekiel. We would put the Prince of Tyre. But it's drawing our attention to something. Now, we're studying right now. First Chronicles, chapter two. And and we're seeing that no that that's our first Samuel first oh, Samuel yeah. first Samuel I knew I knew I was saying something wrong but I couldn't figure out what I was saying wrong <laughs> first Samuel chapter two right yes. and and um, so in doing that what we're seeing is that these things are applying to our movement right now here when we, when you when you read this and I saw this this statement um it got me thinking really about the significance of what ezekiel represents to this movement right right now now we could say well the connection here is is rather tenuous i mean this is ellen white's not particularly commenting on what we're doing but but here she she does something that's kind of odd right to put ezekiel here and and you say it occurs twice in her writings, two different places that yes. she does. So we have a doubling of it, right? So we have a symbol. And now what does Ezekiel symbolize? So that, that's a really broad question, but um, what does he symbolize? I've always taken it that Ezekiel symbolizes the movement in general. Okay. Yeah, well, he, he, he symbolizes, because remember, he's going to start prophesying on the fifth day of the fourth month. Right. Which is, in, in his time, in 592, it's going to be July 21st right. on the Julian calendar. We know 
But the fifth day of the fourth month in 1844 is going to be also July 21st, but on the Gregorian calendar. And so that Ezekiel represents Samuel Snow. That is, there's a connection between Ezekiel and Samuel Snow. And, and that connection, which connects him uh, with Snow, has to do with Samuel Snow's letters and, of course, Midnight and the Midnight Cry. So all of these different things that were tied together. And so I see Ezekiel here jumping out to me as a symbol speaking to this movement. Now, in this case, though, the one that is exalting himself and thinks he's wiser than Daniel is the Prince of Tyre. Can we say that thou, and, and use it ironically, right, even though Ellen White's not using it ironically, but say that this movement thinks that it's wiser than Daniel. Right. Right. And there is no secret that they can hide from thee. So that it's referring somewhat to the pride of this movement. Now, the the other part that you're, in, in the way that you're addressing this, mm -hmm. when I was led to bold the little, the little portion that said he was older than Daniel, yeah. It was because there were some things that were having to run through my mind. Now, here again, I'm more than willing to be corrected. So I put this out. If I'm if I'm saying something that's not right, any of you can correct me on this. Mrs. White writes after this portion, Daniel was growing in favor with kings and with nobles. I don't think we have any disagreement with that whatsoever. But then she said he was about to fill the important place of Ezekiel, and yet Ezekiel was not at all envious, but was glad that God was bringing in younger men, Daniel and his fellows, to stand firmly in the honor of God. Now, Ezekiel was a priest, correct? Yeah. And as a priest, he was of the tribe of Levi, correct? Yeah. Daniel was of the tribe of Judah, mm -hmm. and Daniel was a eunuch. Yeah. How could a eunuch fill the important place of a priest according to the statutes that have been written about the Levites' service? I mean, how could one from the tribe of Judah do that so this ha this is offered again in an as you would say in an ironic situation so how do we approach this okay well i don't sure i fully followed all that so because daniel's not a priest ezekiel is you're saying correct. daniel was a eunuch ezekiel wasn't correct yeah. and now <clears throat> Okay, before I come back, I just got it. So he was older than Daniel. So how old was Daniel when he was taken captive? Ellen White says he was uh, 15 or 16. Okay. So um, if he's taken captive, well, in 607, right? Right. So, so let's say he was 15. Then he would have been born in 622 BC, right? You would add. 607. I mean, you could, it's near the end of 607. And then Ezekiel, we don't know. Now, it is sort of assumed that in 592, when he says in the 30th year, uh, he's referring to the 30th year of the Jubilee cycle. And I, I put in my paper that, it, you know, it's possibly how old he was as well. But, but he could have been older, right? Now, reason why we say 30, uh, because Ezekiel's a priest. And what happens when a, a priest is 30? Many begin to serve in the temple. Right. Yeah. So so, so he, he can then serve in the temple, right? So they would be very similar in age. It's possible that Ezekiel is only slightly older than Daniel, right? We don't know how much. But, but Daniel would have to have been 15. Um, and it's interesting that Ellen White... You know, she picks up on these little details, but they're close. I, I don't get, I, I don't get that from what she's saying. To me, she's saying Ezekiel is like a father to a son thing, and he's going to be about at least 
on the region elf anyway, at least 20 years old. So you're saying he's um, way old? Oh, 20, 20 years older than Daniel. Is that what she says? Well, she says he was like a father to them. Okay. So my impression is he's in his 50s anyway, because Daniel at this year time, what is it? Yeah, I'm to get what you're saying. He's, he's, Daniel's going to be about 30 years old at that time. Okay. So Daniel's going to be at the time that um, the okay. So you're saying when Ezekiel begins prophesying, Daniel's going to be thirty, right? In five ninety two. So Ezekiel is older. Um, I think around that time when he's he's talking about. Um, well, yes, when he begins prophesying, so he would be about thirty. Daniel oh, yeah. would be about 30, so Ezekiel, Ezekiel's going to be about 50, I think. So that 30th year has nothing to do with Ezekiel's age. Okay, so it has nothing to do with his cycle. Age. Okay. Okay. So it's just some detail I never noticed. Right. Uh, lots of people just say, well, you know, Ezekiel's 30, that's all it refers to. We do know it refers to the Jubilee cycle because we have a Jubilee that matches up with that 30 years in uh, uh, five, five, um, 573, right? Uh, the last prophecy of Ezekiel, which is in the 10th day of the seventh month in the Jubilee year. So, um, okay. So anyway, the point going back to this, uh, putting Ezekiel in here and, and what Dwight was saying, I didn't really follow exactly what you were saying regarding that. Just that we have Ezekiel and Daniel, they serve different roles? No. Okay. At this point, <clears throat> Ezekiel, in this in this conversation, Ezekiel is a priest. Yeah. Daniel is not a priest. Yeah. Ezekiel is of the tribe of Levi, and Daniel is of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. Now, the situation here is he was about to fill the important place of Ezekiel. So Ezekiel was a priest and a prophet. Yeah, right? Daniel is not a, not a priest. He's just a prophet. Okay. Now, Daniel could not have served as a priest because first he was of Judah. Second, yeah. second he was a eunuch. Yeah. But in this in this situation, Daniel is going to fill the important place of Ezekiel. Now, mm -hmm. is then Ezekiel giving a representation of the movement? And is Daniel then giving a representation, let's say, of the 144,000? Mm -hmm. no. Okay. That would be my guess, no. Um, I don't think we could do that. Um, what I can say is that Ezekiel here represents, in, in, in this context of how we're applying this, he represents a particular message um, that's given in this movement. So, okay. um, so I'm just taking this that this is, I mean, it's not meant to be a rebuke of Ezekiel in the context here, but if we're going to take this and apply it, we would see this as a rebuke of this movement. That is, this movement is being put in the place of the Prince of Tyre, right? Now, that's not Ellen White's intent at all, right? She's just going to use a verse that's meant to be used ironically about the Prince of Tyre, and she's just going to use this verse as talking about Ezekiel and how God had favored Ezekiel. You understand what I'm saying? That she's she's going to use this verse, and we're not using it the way she's using, but we're, we're saying the fact that she uses it, she uses it twice in this manner, points to us at this time as a rebuke to this movement in its pride. Right. <clears throat> and, and that definitely relates to what we see happening in Second Chronicles, or, or Second Samuel, Second okay. Samuel. Or First Samuel, chapter two. Right. right. There we go. <laughs> so, uh, 
hopefully that makes sense to people. What, what I'm saying is that, that this is, you know, we're using something in the spirit of prophecy here that Ellen White never intended. Just like we often use things in the Bible in the way that the author never intended, but they are symbols. God oversees all of these things. So, so, so I think that there is a significance here, but our attention is drawn to it. Right. And this is all about him that honoreth me will I honor. Right. Correct. And, and, and the opposite. So, so we can see that this movement, just as the church, you know, has not fulfilled its role. And, and so God is asking each of us individually to fulfill the role that he has created for us. Now, this one's interesting, too. This word of the living God is of infinite value if it finds entrance into the heart, the heart receiving it as the word of God. This means that its truths are applicable to the soul. Uh, the revealed truths with their convincing power, finding entrance to the understanding and heart, become the power of God in the transformation of character of believers because they are not only hearers, but doers of the word. All their conversation which is how they live and course of action are in harmony with the education received from the word living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. They have a divine instructor and are practical doers of the lessons received. Right. So, so we can see that the purpose of God's word is to speak to us individually. It's not just talking about the past. The Bible is not just a bunch of dry facts. And, and we've seen this illustrated here. What if Daniel and his companions had made a compromise with those heathen officers, right? So this is talking about the test when they didn't want to eat the food that was sacrificed to idols and all the unclean food and stuff in, in when they were taken captive, right? So they asked to be tested by just eating uh, vegetables, which, of course, would not uh, infringe upon, you know, wouldn't have been idolatry to do that, right? But they didn't uh, depart from principle, right? And if they had, it would have weakened their sense of right and their abhorrence of wrong, right? One wrong step would probably have led to others until their connection with heaven being severed, they would have been swept away by temptation, right? And we, we all have experienced that, that one wrong step in our lives. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, you know... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so so it's something to think about, um, you know, as we, you know, continue to study. Um, okay, um, so I know I don't want to read all of this. There's lots of good stuff here. There's a lot of very practical examples in all of this that I saw looking strictly at First Samuel 2, verse 30. Yeah. So... It pointed out a lot of issues for me within my character that needed to change. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, and and people can go through and read all this. It's just to me, it's too much to read in our studies. I mean, I'm just getting through this. Yeah, can you scroll back down for a second to where she talks about Edson, her son? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just want to read that. Okay. Why don't we read it for the group? Well, I cannot say yeah, if my son Edson is not saved, blot out my name from the book of life. No, no. So here in this context, it's like if my son is, 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 is not saved, I don't want to be saved either. That's the kind of idea. And who is she quoting? Talk about the situation. Who is she quoting? I'm not quoting anyone. Well, no, that's Moses. Symbolically, she's she's quoting Moses. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, but that's not what Moses was saying. Well, that's what he said. Yeah, but no, well, he didn't say but that. But not exactly. in the same way. Okay, not technically, in the same way yeah, using. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, technically, <laughs> it's not a quote, but the thought is there, right? That's what Moses was saying. But if not, no, yeah. no, it's not what he was yeah, saying. Well, what was no. he saying? So I've always understood it. Like, basically, if, if yeah, you know, take my name out of the book of life, if Israel's not going to be saved. Yes, but with a much different intent than what she's using here. The way okay, that I... But, 
that okay it could be, isn't, it could be so you're ways. being really really technical but Moses basically yeah. said if I'm if you can't save Israel take my name out of the book of life is that Moses yeah. was willing to give up his eternal life to save Israel is that basically yes what yeah. was going on there? Now, now it could be Ellen White saying she cannot say that in the sense that she doesn't have that in herself but that's not what I think she's saying I think okay, she's perhaps we should just read finish more the book and see what she's that. saying okay yeah I cannot say. I just want to get that. Block yeah. my name out of the book. I just want to get that part about Moses because it's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I cannot say if my son Edson is not saved, block my name out of the book of life. No, no. I shall sorrow while you live in disobedience to God, who is just and holy, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty. I have love, deep and fervent love, for my two children that are living, and Emma, my daughter. I hope to do them good as long as they both shall live, but I hope not to show respect and honor to either of them, if in thus doing I dishonor God. I have respect to truth, to verity, to righteousness. When you surrender to God, I am, the, I am one with you, but God forbid I should even appear to sanction your course in any respect when you are in rebellion against God, because you want to be revenged. On whom? Your mother, your brother, your your God, and show resentment to those who think you think have injured you. What has the Lord Jesus done for you that he should be treated with contempt and put to open shame and crucified afresh? So she's here using this in a different sense than Moses used it. This is more that selfish mother who um, is going to excuse everything of their children. That's what she's saying. So she's using this in a different sense than Moses. Does that make sense? Yeah, she's contrasting it to what Moses said, really. She's, she's saying she cannot say that because why? No, what she's saying is people use this as their love for their children, right? You know, oh, if my son can't be saved, you know, I don't want to be saved. Can I ask, uh, have y'all sent these letters out? What's that? What's that? Have you um, sent these out to uh, everybody? Yeah. It's on the WhatsApp group. And it's also, and, and um, the link, uh, it's also on, on my, uh, also on my academia. Yeah. That, Kelly? that doesn't help me either. Maybe send it in an email it would be helpful. Just go to academia. All my papers Just send it in an email. I'll okay. send it to you, Kelly. <laughs> Thank you, man. Anyway, so you can see here that Ellen White is using this in a much different way than it's Moses. It's hard to find stuff. It's just hard to find stuff. It's easier. And even if you, like, send an update for the schedule and stuff, just to include it when you're doing that. Okay. All, all I know is that if you want something, you go to uh, palmoni.org or my academia site. And then because I send stuff to people and they keep having me resend it all the time. So, you know, I'm going to forget, right, to resend everything every time. But anyway, but you understand the quote now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That was good to review that. Yeah. I yeah. do understand how she's yeah. applying that. Yeah, because you have, you know, it's like, you know, the parent who goes into the school, how come my son's failing? You know, how come you're failing my son? You know, it's it's these indulgent parents. And what she's saying is she can't she can't take that sort of stance. Right. That's the way I take it. it and it's definitely not she's not she's not really quoting Moses in this context. I mean, she is, but she's using it in a much different sense than Moses. Because when Moses used it, he could say that because he was showing the heart of God, uh, what Christ did to come and redeem us. Yeah, so so here's another example then, how mm -hmm. she uses scripture, not it was in in a different app, a different way, sort of. Well, it's not scripture, but yeah, the but idea she's, or the concept uh, of scripture, yeah. she's using it oppositely. Yeah, 
Exactly. Because, because often it's used by parents in her day, you know, uh, if my kid can't be saved, I don't want to be saved either sort of thing as a way of sort of appealing to God, uh, trying to manipulate God. Right. Mm. Right. To save yeah. their kids. Right? And then the so proper, can... proper and right motivation would be how Jesus was, right? Because yeah. Jesus was willing to lay down his eternal life for us. Right. So it's it's not a, a, a peevish parent, uh, you know, complaining to God about, you know, and in, in excusing their son's actions. Right. That's not what Moses is. Well, sort of what I would call a, or sort of what I would call a pity party. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. so you can see why she's why she's using this here because it's misused by others in that sense. Now, if somebody really truly cared enough for their children that they would be willing to sacrifice their own life for their children, that would be shown in in how they treat their children in in correcting them, right? Right. But often parents were indulgent, um, just as they are today, right? They indulge their children. They allow them to get away with a lot of things. They excuse their actions. Um, and that's not what God does with humanity, or that's not what Moses was doing with the children of Israel, okay? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if we're going to try to apply all of this to you know, what we're looking at right now, because it's it's a difficult thing that we've been doing um, in First Samuel chapter two, um, looking at the symbols that are there addressing our movement, uh, the mistakes that have been made as far as, you know, the, the, the selfishness that has existed within the movement and and only those that that honor God will God honor. Right. People think because they have been a part of the work, uh, they've taken on certain positions and responsibilities in the past, that somehow that excuses them for the way that they have mistreated others. And, and none of us are in this position. The light that's been given to us, it doesn't matter that it's been given to us if we don't obey that light. If we're not changed by it, you know, I can say you know, all of the study that I've done, it means nothing if, if I'm not changed. If my character is not transformed, it doesn't matter how much light God gave me, you know, individually. Actually, it's a greater responsibility, the light that's given to us, to, to live up to it. And, and this movement has, has, has mocked the church because the church you know, isn't doing the right thing. We've worse than the church, right? I've been treated worse in this movement than ever the church treated me. And I'm, I'm not complaining, like I'm not, like, don't want you to feel sorry for me or anything. It's just a reality. It doesn't affect me, right? It's not like I'm bitter about it or anything because I don't have any feelings about it other than my concern for the people who've, who've fallen away from the truth. And, you know, and I look at the part that I've had to play in that, you know, I, I try to re-examine what I've done and should I have done this differently or that differently. But but the reality is that we are self-righteous and, and it's brought such a contempt to the truth. You know, when, yeah. when, I, when I think about the reaction of, you know, ministers and, and different people to this movement, you know, I sympathize with them, right? Because the people yeah, that they deal with, you know, well, obviously, you know, they're they're problem people who have who have attached themselves to this message, and and why is that? Yeah. You know, um, I remember um, Heidi and I went to a, a funeral, and it was a person who was in Central Edmonton Central that had passed away, and. You know, it was, it, was, it was during a weekday, um, so, you know, probably a lot of the people who work and stuff, uh, you know, didn't show up. But when we looked around, you know, it was the people who were there, most of them 
were people who probably should be in mental institutions. I mean, there was not very many normal people at that funeral, uh, the pastor included. <laughs> you know, a pastor showed up at a funeral, uh, you know, with a leather jacket on. Um, it was, we were pretty disappointed in that. Um, kind of odd. What's that? It's kind of odd. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and there's just lots of people there. I mean, they, they, they were people with mental illnesses. Now, I'm not saying, you know, like I hate them or anything. I'm just saying that what has happened in Adventism is that many people who have attached themselves to Adventism are crazy people. And, and, and God does, you know, God allows that to happen. Satan wants to attach people to the truth to give discredit to it. And the same things happen in our movement. People have been. But why would why why would it be that there were so many people struggling with mental illness that show up at this funeral? Did they know the person, or like was? Oh yeah, the, they know the person. Yeah, they knew the person. So it was. So it was, But how many people would you say were there? Like it's a big church. Well, yeah, there was probably about a uh, hundred. And you're saying the majority of them would be. Uh, yeah. Why? Well, I knew the majority of Second them. Mate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it would it would be, you know, qualify for a section eight. Yeah. Which is the police would come and arrest them and bring them to yeah. psychiatric ward. Sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure many of them in 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 mental well, hospitals. Well, I mean will, I'm just William saying to say something, I think. Yeah, well I, I, Yeah. But I didn't hear anything. Yeah, I was gonna say Try again, William. I think yeah. your signals. All right, you see it? Y'all hear me now? Yeah. Gotcha. I, I was just going to say, all of us got a mental mental problem. Yeah. <laughs> we all do, <laughs> right? So, I mean, I'm a, I mean I, I've obviously never been in a mental institution, but, you know, I'm a little bit eccentric. So, you know, the point that I'm trying to make, that's probably a little bit of a, a distraction there. But the point that I'm making is that people are often attached to the truth, and, and sometimes for good reason, in the sense that, that God is trying to redeem us, right? So he, he exposes us to the truth. So I'm not trying to say that, you know, that God only wants to have people that are uh, 100% uh, healthy uh, to accept the truth. But I'm saying so God allows this, right, because he's trying to save people. Uh, but Satan is doing everything he can to discredit the truth. Right. So I remember my brother, Dave, yeah. you know, he, he, he told me that, that I was Theodore. before you go on. Yeah. Before you go on, I got to say this. Yeah, that was really a poor, poor, poor example that you used to use I, I know. mental illness. Yeah, well, I, I understand. I just want to point that out. Did but you it's want true. To apologize or anything because it's wrong. Okay, I'm not going to apologize, but I'll I'll point reason That's why I'm I said it. Say it's wrong. Let me explain I'm why I said it. it. Let me, Kelly. Let me explain. So this is what yeah. people have often pointed out: is that when I go to an Adventist church, I see a bunch of people with mental illness. Now, my brother David pointed really? this out. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, my brother David pointed this out. So he said yeah. uh, every single Adventist he knew was crazy. And and he knew people <laughs> like, uh, no, he knew you. <laughs> but I don't think he was including you. But, but he, he just oh, said he, he knew he knew there was a, a couple in 100 Mile. You know, they weren't married. They were gymnasts. They were Romanian or something like that. They were into like new age weird stuff. Um, there was Raymond Hitchcock. Yeah. I don't know if you remember him, Brother Ray. Rings a bell, Brother yeah. Ray. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah, you know. So, you know, he, there's some really bad things about him. So, my brother David knew all of these different Adventists, and they weren't normal people. Yeah. You know. That's true. <laughs> Right. So and, and I've had many people tell me this about Adventists and I've had people tell me this about Christians in general as well. 
right? I've had, you know, customers in the guitar mm. stores. Oh, every Christian I know is mentally ill. And and they're not wrong. <laughs> right? I don't know how that's kind of a wide, wide net cast. I understand. But but you see my point. The point is God allows you this. Mean could, yeah, but you're just my, rather yeah. than yeah, I do, I do. But rather than say mentally ill, could you say unbalanced? Well, what's the difference? Well, there is a difference. Mental illness, uh, people need medical help. But for someone that's unbalanced, they, you know, they need counseling, perhaps, or therapy I, of some kind. Or I think just in the general parlance, it's there's not really much difference, right? You could say eccentric. That's that's better. Yeah, but um, but but the point is. <laughs> but the point is God yeah. allows us because God is trying to use light to save us. So so we can look at the one side. We can say, well, why are all these people? And, and this is the way that I look at it. I, I see the defects in people who attach themselves to the truth. But it doesn't mean that I think badly of those people. Right. I mean, I know they have misrepresented the truth, but so have I. But God is giving us this light to reform us. We are all defective. And so what has to happen is Christ's character has to come out of us in spite of the fact that we, you know, we are mentally ill. You know, we are eccentric. We got problems. You know, we're unbalanced. Like none of us here are are perfect examples of Christ. And so it's really easy to see how we can misrepresent the truth. And and so in this movement, all of us have misrepresented the truth at some time or other. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I'm going to go back to mentally ill and address okay. that because, you know, I was raised around that. My mother was mentally ill. Uh, I, have, I have an aunt and a friend, both of whom killed their infant children. Um, uh, so I'm quite familiar with when I hear mentally ill, those are the kind of cases I think of people who've been hospitalized for their mental illness. Yeah, and well, I've been, so, I've been around mental illness too. So, yeah, yeah. So that's why I say to say that, you know, all these people are mentally ill. I understand that you're not saying people that need to be in the hospital. Is that right? No, I'm saying that people that needed to be in the hospital were at this funeral yes the majority of the people there were people who were mentally ill okay okay but yet i don't know it, it's it's a it's a little bit of a sensitive topic for me yeah yeah i know you know, I know. And, and to oh. catch to catch and my son too he's bipolar so i've i've dealt with this very close quarters you know it's, and uh I'm just saying that's how people look at it. Yeah, you know, I, I would, I would have to say, yeah, yeah. There are, there's, I don't know what it is about Seventh Day Adventist Church that seems to attract a lot of oddballs, outliers, people who are into conspiracy theories and and odd, odd extraneous beliefs that are ex, whatever that word is, extra beliefs, you know. That, that they try to bring in and add on and carry with them. And, yeah. and, and, I, and yeah. I say it's and, a lot God of is churches that are the same. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think it's because God's trying to save What's people. That, uh, a lot of oh, I was just saying, I, yeah, uh, I find when I was going to the Pentecostal, the Mennonite, et cetera, et cetera, I, I found a lot of weirdos too. But then I'm weird. People, people think I'm weird. My kids <laughs> think I'm crazy. You know, you're crazy, right, Mom? I don't, I, I don't see things the way they do. We're on totally different planes, and most of my kids do not have Christ. And I admit, I'm, I'm really weird, and I enjoy being. Okay, so that is that well, is my as and long as I, it's something positive. And, yeah. See, see, you, you, you guys. This seen, is my, my, Kelly, yeah, let me know, just. I uh, want to make one final point, and and yet I think that that you're right there, Theodore. That that God. Uh, you know, God God chose the foolish things of this world 
to confound the wise. And, and those are the kind of people sometimes that will. But also, we know that the devil brings in his people, right? The unconverted and so on. And they get past the post. Um, but I don't know. There's going to be something that happens that's going to clean it all up. I don't know what it is, but you're right. There's a lot of unusual things that, with people that happen in the church. Okay, go ahead. Thank you for yeah. letting me finish. And, and, and so God is trying to redeem us, right? So if we don't end up being converted, we become a witness against the truth. That's, that's My greatest sure. fear. My yeah. greatest fear, so personally. God help us. But, but we can say that Christ was accused of being a madman, too, and so was Paul. Much learning has made thee mad. You know, thou hast the devil. You know, so that encourages me personally. Like, I, yeah. I told people, I really don't care what you think about. I really anyway, our time's up. Our time's up. We, so we can't. Um, but yeah, so, so you know, I didn't mean to offend anybody. But but I think you see the point, Kelly, now. And, yeah. and, no, and though all of those people. You. I just wanted yeah. to put it on yeah. the record that you did. Yeah. Yeah, and all of the people that um, have dishonored God in the movement, they had an opportunity to honor God, right? God didn't bring them in so that they could fight against the truth, right? It would have been so powerful if this movement, if we had all been changed in character. But we can't do anything about the other people right now. Amen. We, we need to recognize that this this applies to us. Him that honors me shall I honor. And that means we have to honor God. And all of this stuff that we've learned, all of this light, it means nothing if in the end we dishonor God. Right? I, I, uh, Careful yeah, response. You're, you're right. I, that, that's my I, whole point. I, I, wanted, I wanted to concur with Angela there in the that people look at me odd too, even I have family members, but it's because of my beliefs, you know, like I, what I believe you know, keeps the Sabbath. What do you mean? What do you mean you won't go to work on, on the Saturday and you're losing good money. And what do you mean you won't join a union? And what do you mean? No. All of these things that, that are actually odd to the world that seventh day Adventists are, that are biblical beliefs that, you know, they, we are odd. But but even if we're odd, we can draw people to Christ because yeah, if yeah. we have the oddness Christ, actually becomes attractive. Yeah. I and mean, attractive. obviously, you know, obviously, I'm very odd, but some people find that interesting, you know. But anyway, yes, it is. <laughs> okay, well, let's close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we've had here. We know, Lord, that. Uh, in examining our own hearts, we can see that we have not represented you. And uh, we ask for forgiveness for the way that we have, have fallen away in many ways in our lives uh, from representing you. You know our personal struggles. Uh, you know why you have given us this light. And we know, Lord, that um, this light will shine forth at the right time unto the right people. Help us, Lord, to realize that you love each one of us individually and that um, you are seeking to save each one of us, that Jesus came and died for each one. So we give our hearts to you and to Christ, and uh, we ask that you can continue to teach us and fill us with your spirit. Be with each person, watch over them, and bless them, and bring us together again uh, tomorrow morning to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.